Welcome to the first episode of the VSBF webinar miniseries, a look into the future of big science infrastructures. I am Javier Echavarri, Spain's industry liaison officer for ESO and SKA, and I am with CDTI, the Spanish Innovation Agency. I would like to thank all the participants across Europe who have shown interest and have registered and connected to the webinar. We have to say that regis registration has been a huge success. We hope to meet your expectations and to provide a glimpse of what future astronomy research infrastructures will look like in terms of new projects and technologies required by industry in the future. As you all know, CDTI is heading the organization of the second edition of the Big Science Business Forum in collaboration with 11 big science organizations in the areas of astronomy, fusion, and high energy accelerators and synchrotrons. In the path towards BSBF, we have organized a series of webinars. This is actually the fourth one dealing with different topics of interest surrounding the big science market and complementary to what will be presented in Granada next October, which are the business, are the business opportunities from the main big science organizations in the period to 2022 to 2026, worth more than 37 billion euros. This new mini series, which we kick off today, tries to look more into the future to explore the long-term plans of the most relevant astronomy big science RIs. We want to show industry what technologies will be relevant in the long-term and how they, they can get involved. And why this? Because experience shows us that in order to be well-prepared for future procurements, an R&D industrial phase is usually necessary. And knowing the plans of the, of the infrastructures in advance helps industry develop their capabilities. In order to illustrate this long-term view, we have assembled a group of speakers which represent the different scientific disciplines, such as space, ground-based optical astronomy, radio astronomy, solar, and high energy physics. Thank you all for your enthusiasm and for being available for this webinar. We really appreciate it. The agenda, if you, you, if you have taken a look, is broken down into presentations from the five speakers, from the European Space Agency, the European Solar Observatory, the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, the European Solar Telescope, and finally, the Cherenkov Telescope Array Observatory. Each of them will have 20 minutes to explain their future plans. And when we finish, I will welcome Michel Hubner, the Swiss Industrial Liaison Officer, who will moderate the Q&A session. This session will be fed by the questions that you submit using the Zoom Q&A module. Please don't use the chat for the Q&A. Use the Q&A module instead. So before we start with the webinar, let me share my screen so that I give you a few details about BSBF. For these of you not acquainted for the, with the Big Science Business Forum, I will explain that BSBF 2022 is a business-oriented Congress, which will congregate the main European research infrastructures in the domains of astronomy, fusion, and particle physics. It will be focused on technology, and the aim is to be the main meeting point between the European Big Science RIs and industry in order to explore the business opportunities worth more than 37 billion euros in the coming years. The Congress will take place in Granada, city of science and innovation, and also a beautiful and unique city in the south of Spain between the 4th and 7th of October next year. 11 big science organizations, including ESA, ESO, and SKA, which are present today, are full members of the Congress, as well as four affiliated big science organizations. This will be the second edition of the Congress after the successful first edition, which was celebrated in 2018 in Copenhagen. You can see on the screen that the Congress is divided into a two-day program structured by technologies. So depending on which area of work is of your interest, you can sign up to specific technology-oriented parallel sessions, which will cover different topics of interest, such as electronics, instruments, materials, ICT, control systems, or cryogenics and vacuum. In, e in each of these sessions, we will have technical speakers from the different RIs explaining the, the tender opportunities for the coming years. And we will also organize thematic parallel sessions dealing with other topics of interest like research infrastructures in Horizon Europe, industrial opportunities for IFNIF Dones to be built in Granada and SMS. There is also the possibility for non-member research infrastructures to participate in BSBF 2022 as affiliated big science organizations. Now we have four 
affiliated RIs in the Congress, but in January, we will open a new call for new ones. So if you are interested in taking part in BSBF 2022 as an affiliated research organization, please contact with us. The Congress also includes an industrial exhibition. With more than 100 stands already sold, there are still a number of available stands. And BSBF will also host, for the first time, a technology transfer track. The ob objective of this track is to really make technology transfer happen at BSBF, and also to prove that the big science market is a good ecosystem to develop innovative technologies and then transfer them to other markets. Any participant, once he registers to the Congress, can submit a proposal to, to the technology transfer track. And what we will do is promote these technologies and then organize a series of meetings which will take place during the whole Congress between the offerers of the technologies and interested stakeholders in order to explore licensing possibilities, agreements, and so on. But the real heart of BSBF 2022 is the networking supported by uh, pre-arranged meetings, which, which we organize using our platform, our web page, and our mobile application, and which you will, will be able to arrange with any interested parties. We are also organizing two site visits to nearby research infrastructures. And of course, the Congress will include a social pro program for a truly unique experience in Granada in early October. So please take note of the important dates. Early next year, we will open the third and final call for affiliated big science organizations. And besides this, registration to BSBF is already open till 30 April when the early bird registration finishes. After that, there will be no discount. The same date is available as a deadline for the submission of the technology transfer proposals. And right after that, we will open the request for B2B meetings and attendance to technology transfer meetings. And now we can start the presentations. As I said, please submit your questions using the QA module and we will address a selection during the final section of the webinar. The first speaker is Günther Hassinger, Director of Science of ESA. The ESA science program has two objectives. It provides tools to the science community to maintain Europe's competence in space, and it also fosters innovation to industry and science communities. And for this, ESA needs to work with a long-term vision so they start planning now for the missions that ESA wants to launch in two or more decades from now. I'm really grateful to Gunther Hassinger for agreeing to take part in the webinar and for providing highlights on ESA's long-term vision. So Gunther, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Javier. So it's a great honor and pleasure to start off this uh, series of talks um, about the long-term vision of the science program. And as you will see, uh, we are really thinking in very, very long cycles. Um, we are doing typically a 25 year um, um, uh, strategic planning, and we are currently uh, in the cosmic vision era, but we have just completed the next strategic planning cycle, uh, Voyage 2050. And we start, we are standing on the shoulders of giants of the previous uh, cycles, uh, in particular Horizon uh, 2000. Uh, the ESA fleet uh, is distributed among the solar system explorers and the cosmic observers. And in each of these uh, panels, you see the, uh, the, the ongoing missions, the ones in orbit uh, in the middle. You see the legacy missions. We are standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and then you also see that we are preparing a large number of missions for the future. And um, as you will see in a minute, we are typically launching uh, one mission every one and a half years, um, uh, roughly. Um, this is the sequence of all the ESA missions since uh, about 1986, um, and we have these big ones, the so-called um, cornerstones or large missions, and in between we have the medium-sized missions. Uh, the large missions typically take two years worth of budget, uh, while the medium-sized missions take one year uh, of budget, so in the order of 500 million uh, to 600 million, and the large missions more like 1.2, 1.3 uh, billion. And um, every three years, we have to go to the ministerial meeting and ask for the budget for the next three years. And you see this is going up and down depending on the political winds. Um, 
Uh, currently, we are actually in a period of growth where we are hoping that we will get some um, increase in the next ministerial meeting, but we have to all work together uh, to make that possible. Now, um, just two uh, highlights. Um, I cannot go into great details, but you, everybody, I think, still remembers when uh, we were circling, ESA was circling Rosetta around the Comet 67P. And then Philae was landing and it was hopping on the comet surface and then it got lost and got rediscovered. So a real criminal story, but beautiful. And I just want to say that currently we have another hero, uh, which is Gaia. Uh, <clears throat> Gaia, as you will see in a minute, is the most um, powerful uh, scientific uh, project worldwide. It is publishing five papers a day and we are really transforming um, the state of astronomy with uh, this uh, mission and every day new things are, are coming. Now um, we are also involved in the uh, Mars activities. Um, uh, you know ESA itself uh, will start, will launch the ExoMars rover um, uh, next year. But we are also at least uh, uh, laterally um, uh, implementing also uh, help for both NASA and China. Uh, you see that, for instance, when Perseverance landed, more than 60% of the data is actually transmitted through the ExoMars uh, TGO rover back to Earth. And even here, the launch of the Chinese rover, you see that the ESA flag is on the Chinese um, fairing. So we are also helping the Chinese with their um, Mars uh, missions. So it's all one big international family. And I refer to the publications. Our output is from increasing uh, dramatically. And over the last years, it's mainly Gaia, which, as I said, is publishing about 1.6 um, uh, million uh, uh, thousand papers. <laughs> And this can be compared to the Hubble Space Telescope, which is our integral, um, I think, the biggest contributor to astronomy. But Gaia is now actually competing with Hub uh, Hubble for the um, first place in, uh, in astrophysics. Um, we are also getting some excitement by the, the probes that we are sending into the inner solar system. There are two probes currently on their way, Solar Orbiter uh, and Bepi Colombo. And both of these probes, uh, Solar Orbiter studying the Sun, Bevy Colombo studying Mercury, both of these probes require um, planetary flybys in order to help with the gravity assist maneuver to break their orbit and so that they come into the inner solar system. We had one exciting period in August where both these probes were actually flying by Venus um, within just a day of each other. And just two days or three days ago, um, Bevy Colombo for the first time flew uh, by its destination, Mercury, and it has produced the very first picture of Mercury, which is already very um, exciting. I mean, these are small uh, web cameras on the board of uh, the satellite just to uh, look at the guiding uh, system, but um, they also see the photobombs of the planets in the, in the background. Um, so on our long-term vision, we always have to select the next big mission typically 10 years before they um, will launch. And this year has been very exciting because we have selected as the next um, M-class mission Envision, which is a, a mission to map Venus <clears throat> in cooperation with NASA because NASA is providing the radar. But simultaneously, almost simultaneously, NASA has announced two own missions to Venus. And our Indian colleagues have announced a mission to go to Venus. And so this next decade, while this decade is dominated by Mars research, the next decade will be dominated by Venus research. And I think that will give Venus back some of the important um, uh, focus because it is a very important planet to understand climate change. Uh, it has may have been similar to Earth in the past and now it's completely different as you know. Uh, very exciting for all of us this year on 18th of December, we will launch the James Webb Telescope. We are very proud that NASA is entrusting us with the launch uh, from an Ariane 5 uh, rocket. And we are all eager to see the first data from, from James Webb. Now, uh, the future, um, the next big mission that ESA will launch is JUICE, uh, the Jupiter icy moon uh, mission which will actually fly through the Jovian system and will then in particular concentrate uh, on Ganymede, uh, will study Ganymede um, to death, so to speak. And JUICE is um, a very large mission, but it is um, 
has kept its budget and it's also almost keeping its schedule. So we are not 100% sure that we can uh, launch it in Oct uh, August uh, 26, 22. There is some possibility that it will slip into 23. And then we will cruise to Jupiter for about 10 years before we um, can really start the science. So one thing you have to learn in space science is really patience. You, know, you need time. And that brings me to the uh, next part. So this is juice just before we wave it goodbye uh, in the test chamber, just to see, give you a, a figure, figure of scale, how, how huge these installations are. Um, and then uh, after juice, um, the next two missions uh, will be Athena, an X-ray observatory and Lisa, a gra gravitational wave observatory. And we have actually made it very important that Athena and Lisa should try to fly together as far as possible because there are very exciting phenomena that you can study by, for instance, merging black holes where you see the gravitational waves on one hand and you see the X-rays on the other hand. And so bringing sound to the cosmic movies is really a, a very important theme. But this is for the next 10 years, we'll put a big push on our program because we have to implement two large missions in parallel, which is, has never been done before. And so this is really, uh, in terms of managing the program, uh, quite uh, difficult. Each of these missions is about uh, 1.3 to 1.5 billion. So uh, we will hear about the EELT later. Each of these missions is roughly the cost of one EELT. And so we have to manage two of these. Uh, and as I said before, we have now published the Voyage 2050 um, exercise. And this is in particular important, not only for the scientists, but also for industry, because we have to start developing the technology for the next big things. And so in addition to the three topics for the large missions that have now been identified, the first mission will go to an icy moon or to a moon of one of the giant planets, either Jupiter, Saturn, but maybe even Uranus or Neptune. The second mission is focused on exoplanets um, with, the, with the dream to maybe get um, a picture or a spectrum of an exoplanet. And then the third mission is focused on the early universe with new high precision te techniques like um, uh, high, high resolution uh, cosmic microwave background spectroscopy or quantum gravity um, uh, gravitational wave uh, detectors. And the, um, uh, this is a bottom-up process from the, from the community. And the community is giving us strong recommendations about the technologies that we need to develop in the next uh, decade in order to make these missions possible. One of those technologies is cold atom interferometry, uh, very high precision gravity measurements, uh, possibly X-ray interferometry, which is very exciting because you could get a picture of a black hole in a similar way as the Event Horizon Telescope. Uh, new power and heat sources in order to go out into the solar system. And then a very exciting possibility, cryogenic sample uh, return. And I will spend a few more um, minutes on the cryogenic sample return because one of the targets that you see here is Enceladus. Uh, Enceladus is um, an ice land, an ice um, uh, world, but it has an ocean, a liquid water ocean beneath the ice. And there are cracks in the ice through which cryovolcanism happens. And there is actually water coming out um, from the surface. And if there is any possibility to have real existing life outside the Earth, this is a very good way, a very highly possible um, way of uh, finding um, existing life um, on another solar system uh, planet. And so uh, what we are starting to do we are starting to dream even bigger. You know that our large missions are typically 1.2, 1.5 billion. We are currently considering a way of um, uh, accelerating and expanding our envelope by uh, doing maybe two of these missions together uh, in the so-called icy moon sample return mission. So the idea is to use one of the L slots of, the, of Voyage 2050 to go to the icy moon but then to use another um, uh, infrastructure, another uh, budget to actually put a lander on the surface to drill into the ice, to bring an ice core back to earth and to study whether there are bacteria or some, whether there's any life um, in, in this material. And so uh, unlike our normal mission, which are launched by a single rocket, in this case, we would need two rockets, one rocket launching the mission, 
another rocket just bringing the fuel dispenser and then do a gas station in orbit to fill up the tank completely because we don't have a rocket that is big enough to uh, fill a tank that has to go to Saturn and back. Uh, you then go to Saturn, you are expelling a small lander. The lander is landing on the, and Enceladus, uh, is drilling the ice core, is then ejected again uh, and is um, this is similar to the mass sample um, return concept. The, the ascent module is basically handing over the sample to the satellite. The satellite returns to Earth and is then bringing the sample safely uh, to Earth. This would be a mission which in total is 20 to 25 years duration because you have to go there, you have to come back. But on the way, we are developing technology and new schemes that are really very exciting for uh, other applications. And so in particular, industry should be very keen to try to help us to follow up. So with this, I would like to stop and I'm very um, happy uh, to be available for our questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you, Inter. It was really a fascinating presentation to see all these long-term plans and and, uh, and, and the scope of them, and also knowing that industry has has the possibilities to participate in these projects. So thank you very much, and please remain for questions at the end. Thank you also for, for respecting the time. This is really good. So now, after Genter, we have uh, Norbert Huban, who is the manager of the development program at ESO. So as you know, ESO is the European Solar Observatory, and they are currently fully committed towards building the building the extremely large telescope, the ELT. Sorry, a, Javier, it's, a, it's the European Southern Observatory. Ah, Southern. Not, what, I don't know what I said. Solar. No, not solar. <laughs> definitely not. So they are building the ELT, which with a primary diameter of 39 meters will be the first of a generation of extremely large optical telescopes operating in the infrared and visible. But ESO, and this is the objective of, of the talk today, also takes a look ahead and manages a development program which funds different technologies to be applied in different instruments and optics. So we have Norbert Huban, who leads this group, who will illustrate on these technologies and how industry can get involved. Thanks, Norbert. Yes, I'm trying to share again. Um, this tattoo, maybe this one. Do you see the screen or no? We can see the screen, but not the presentation. Ah, okay, sorry about this. These things always happen. Yeah. <laughs> it worked before, but now it doesn't work. Okay. Now we can see in, if you change it to full screen mode, it will be fine. Is it okay it's, now? It's fine now, thank you. Good, so uh, good morning everybody. So I'm Mauro I'm working in the uh, Directorate of Forum at the uh, European Southern Observatory. And I'm going to uh, present um, our development program and future plans. So first, uh, before I move to details about technologies, I, I, I thought it would be useful to show the ISO context and uh, optical infrastructure. So you have on the left, uh, the uh, existing uh, very large telescope with a uh, VLTI, uh, with a four eight meter telescope and a number of instruments uh, already in operations. Uh, we have also four 1.8 meter telescope and we have an interferometric mode. We have two survey, two meter and four meter class telescope. And uh, as part of this program, we have a continuous renewal of instrument and improved capabilities requiring new technologies. And uh, in particular, sorry. Um,
Don't worry, sorry about this. Yes, so in particular, uh, here in, in, in yellow, you have the uh, new instruments which are either uh, being built or in design or in plan uh, for the next uh, 10 years. So uh, you see that we have quite a number of instruments uh, which goes from interferometric instrument with Gravity Plus, which is a follow-up of the gravity facility, um, uh, which allow us to observe the galactic center and got the Nobel Prize in 2021, and uh, uh, imagers, uh, spectrograph, uh, uh, and so forth. On the right, so we have the big project in construction. So um, uh, this has started uh, already a few years ago. This is a 39 meter telescope with a primary mirror uh, uh, with 798 uh, high precision segment realigned uh, at the nanometer level in real time. Uh, the science for this telescope is uh, exoers, deep universe, laser population, open window to the unknown and so forth. As mentioned before, uh, this is a 1.3 uh, billion investment. And there is, of course, a large effort by ISO, but also by the uh, astronomical community to build first and second generation instrument requiring new technologies. So this is a context. Uh, so an important aspect of this large uh, telescope is adaptive optics, of course. So uh, here, just to illustrate, so this is the Orbital Space Telescope, which, uh, um, I don't understand why this, uh, this thing jump all the time. And uh, uh, you see uh, what has been achieved already on the VLT in the middle in terms of uh, angular resolution and accuracy. And on the right, this is what we expect from the VLT when it is fully operational. So in terms of technology development approach, uh, uh, so we have uh, different ways of developing technology. So innovative technologies for telescope subsystem are developed within the construction project, either during the phase A of the telescope or phase B or phase Lee is largely done in collaboration and thanks to the industry. Uh, and I will show some example uh, in the next slide. In few cases, we have passed final projects uh, on smaller telescopes we are used to prepare for larger telescope needs, so using VLT to demonstrate technology and, and then uh, put it on the ELT. Uh, we have some innovative technology with uh, te technology readiness level five and six are also developed within the instrument construction in collaboration with European uh, uh, Institute. Uh, a few examples we provided and we have low technology, te technology readiness level technologies which uh, are covered by a dedicated uh, technology development program. So these are the different ways of pushing technologies. So here is an example uh, was being done by, um, by uh, industry. Uh, so here is Safra. Uh, so this is the uh, manufacturing of all the segments for the M1 of the ELT. So factory has been built, a new process has been developed, a robotic, uh, 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 bonding has been done as well, uh, and so forth. Uh, another example, uh, uh, so you see here, another example of, of technology developed by, uh, developed by industry uh, it, it is, uh, I, I, I don't understand why this jump all the time, but sorry. Um, so this is uh, the adaptive uh, deformable mirror uh, which was developed by the, uh, at the VLT, so 1.1 meter telescope, uh, uh, deformable mirror. And, and this technology was, of course, uh, developed further for the ELT with a 2.4 meter uh, adaptive mirror with 5,300 actuators to correct for the atmosphere. So this is uh, the picture you have on the right. So this is collaboration, Adoptica, shot Safran for the thin shell, which is uh, about two millimeter thick. Uh, so it's very uh, thin uh, piece of glass in zero due. Um, so this is an example uh, picture here uh, uh, during an acceptance done uh, at, uh, at Safran uh, for these uh, very thin shells. And on the left, you have the thin shell with the magnets, uh, which represent actually the actuators uh, of the uh, M4 uh, adaptive mirror for the ELT. 
So this is big technologies, uh, a lot of development in gluing, in manufacturing optics, and, and so forth. Uh, one important point is, of course, uh, when you have 7,000 segment, uh, 700 segment uh, for the primary mirror, you need to, to maintain the optical surfaces. So uh, here's another example of uh, uh, technologies developed by Fogal, Nanotech, and FEMS um, uh, for edge sensor, which are very high accuracy, which guarantee the, the, actually the co-phasing of this big mirror. So this is another uh, technology which is uh, being developed in the frame of an industrial contract here. So here you have an overview uh, uh, of the ELT. So I, I remove the, 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 the structure of the, um, of the telescope. So we see the primary mirror. We have two platforms, one on the left, one on the right, and one on the left. So we will have the first generation first light instruments. So three instruments in a system. And on the right, you have the second generation, so longer term instruments, uh, which are in concept. The, uh, the instrument on the right, uh, on the left, are actually uh, finishing the design and will start construction uh, very soon. So you see here, uh, so the first generation instrument, and uh, I, I try to identify the key technologies which are required for these instruments. So we have, uh, uh, as you see, uh, METIS, a mid-infrared instrument, Harmony, a near-infrared AO assisted 3D spectrograph. We have Nikado, a near-infrared adaptive optics assisted instrument. And you have Maori, which is a multi-conjugate AO system, which will feed uh, the Mikado instrument. And, and here I've listed uh, the key technologies that uh, are needed uh, uh, for these instruments, which has some challenges, let's say. So using GeoSnap infrared detector, for instance, with digital interface, having uh, about 500, 500 millimeter freeform cryogenic optics uh, working at 40, 70 K, reliable low dissipation cryogenic mechanism, low vibration cooling system, and, and, and so forth. So, so the, these are the technologies we need to be developed in the frame of the construction of the instrument. We have, of course, uh, for Maori, for instance, uh, very large dark rig, relatively large dark rig, which are also uh, very challenging to, to develop. And, and for Mikado, also uh, dark rig infrared visible of the diameter of 400 millimeter to be, to be produced. So, so we have quite a number of technology here to push forward. And this is done, of course, in close collaboration with uh, our astronomical community and institutes. So uh, if we look at longer term, uh, so uh, second generation instruments and technologies uh, needed. Uh, so we have two instruments, Mosaic and RS. So Mosaic is multi-object AO assisted spectrograph, which is in design. There we need large format uh, volume phase holographic gratings for medium resolution, curve detectors uh, or curve CCD for K by 4K. Coating with high performance um, down to uh, 350 nanometer. Um, for high-res, we also need a high efficiency grating with higher resolution, robust and high efficiency fiber for K-band, coating with high performance down to 350 nanometer, and uh, very important as well, ultra-stable calibration sources like uh, uh, laser frequency gold. So this is a, simply a list of uh, a sample of uh, VPH grating. So th these kind of components are slowly disappearing from the market. So, so this is something we need to maintain uh, for astronomical applications uh, in the coming year. So just to illustrate that. So in terms of curve detectors, so we have been relatively active in this business. So curve detector allowing compact and lighter and simpler instrument optics. Uh, so this is very important, especially for this big instrument. It was first idea proposed in 2009, 2012 as part of a research and development at ESO. It was the first 4K prototype developed by ITL in the US, which is a contract uh, uh, from ESO with a 500 meter curvature radius. There was uh, also an activities for, by ESA in close contact with ESO. We launched a study prototype in 2018 with E2D. And more recently in 2020, there was an agreement between ESA and ESO to uh, actually contract Teledyne E2V um, uh, curve CCD detector for K by 4K uh, with a goal to, uh, to have uh, uh, scientific uh, detectors in which we can do imaging tests, performance assessment, process improvement, shape accuracy and repeatability, uh, especially if you need 
this curve, the detector multiplied by 20 for, for multi object spectrograph, you want exactly the same kind of curvature. So, so this is something which is ongoing. And for the future, if you look forward, uh, we could also curve CMOS devices, uh, which seems to be the future, and also curve infrared detector also in the future. Uh, in terms of ultra stable calibration source, so laser frequency curve. So uh, there is about 20 astronomers uh, at observatory in the world. Two were uh, developed uh, uh, by ESO in collaboration with industry. Uh, so you, you see here the coverage in wavelengths and in uh, comb line spacing in gigahertz. So this is where we are. So uh, of course, this is never enough for, for the upcoming instrument, especially for the one going very much to the UV. Uh, so uh, what we want to do, uh, ideal future laser frequency com system uh, is, is really to extend to the UV, so three, uh, below 380 nanometer, go to the near infrared at least, and maybe one not uh, uh, to the mid infrared, uh, to have tunable line spacing, allowed to shift spectral line on detector and to adapt to, to various spectral resolution. And as I said, extend wavelength coverage. So you see, we need to, to, to push in the vertical, we need to push the technology in horizontal, in wavelength and, and from light spacing. So this is something that uh, we will uh, uh, push uh, in, in the coming uh, uh, few years. So uh, longer term again, uh, so ELT is supposed to do a planetary uh, uh, detection. So, so characterize nearby Earth like the planet, find biomarkers. Concept is extreme adaptive optics with high resolution spectroscopy or differential uh, imaging, time scale, ongoing research and development. So, so this is what we, we are doing now. Project uh, actually we start 2025 with a projected first light in 2035. So this is essentially the goal. Uh, so uh, what does it mean? The Earth are very faint objects and very difficult to observe. So essentially, uh, the goal of this kind of instrument is to take a picture of fireflies from 2,000 miles away, which sits next to a lighthouse beam, and to achieve, uh, so the instrument should achieve essentially a contrast of 10 to the minus 9, which is relatively challenging. So I don't want to enter in the concept. So uh, the goal here will be to use the adaptive optics system, which is already embedded into the ELT itself and to add the second stage AO system with many, many actuators, actually 128 by 128 actuators, we're running a three curious frequency, uh, and to, um, to, to inject uh, this result into uh, uh, integral fee spectrograph uh, using fibers. Um, so what is very important for this system is to have different mirrors, this is clear. Uh, this is also to go very fast and uh, implement a clever uh, algorithm like machine learning algorithm into real-time computer and possibly curve near infrared detectors. So th this is the kind of thing that uh, we need to push forward in the coming years. And, um, and in terms of uh, uh, extreme adaptive there for one mirror. So we have some key requirements, as I said, over 128 and by 128 makes about 16,000 actuators in the diameter of about uh, uh, 150 to 450 millimeter, depending on the actuator pitch. Uh, we will need a relatively small stroke because this, is a, this will be a second stage AO system. So stroke of three micron with very high resolution, a fraction of the nanometer, uh, and so forth. So this is the kind of technology that we want to develop uh, now. So we started already in the first round to uh, develop this technology with a company in Alpao in France. So uh, you see here an actual different bond mirror with 3,228 actuators uh, with a six nanometer MS space flat. So th this is the first step. And the idea was, would be to continue um, to develop this kind of technology uh, in, in the coming two to three years. Uh, possibly in collaboration with other institutes. Uh, so ESA has shown some interest also for, for space, but NASA as well. So um, that's probably uh, some collaboration to set up here. Uh, last CMOS development, this is another thing that uh, we believe that should be developed uh, to guarantee long-term access to scientific quality detectors in a visible wavelength for astronomy. 
So, so far, astronomy and space is actually using CCD, uh, which are the set of the art visible detectors. Uh, so, CCD production is decre decreasing in favor of CMOS in public market, as you, you know. Uh, so, we are left with uh, about uh, one or 1.5 1 suppliers worldwide, uh, which are still producing large format CCDs. So, this is a bit worrying. Uh, we are a bit concerned by availability or no guaranteed uh, availability of this kind of ship in the next decade. So the goal will be to try to uh, push forward CMOS detector for scientific applications. Um, this is also something that ESA has done uh, in the ELFIS development program. And, and, and the idea will be to try to, to find synergies here and, and to put more effort into this kind of uh, technologies to, to secure the long term availability of scientific detectors for astronomy. Um, in terms of laser gas stars, so as you know, adaptive optics uh, alone uh, has a very small sky coverage. So uh, what has been proposed something like 25 years ago was to use laser gas stars. So this is what was developed over the last uh, 20 years uh, at ESO. So we have now uh, available on the market, uh, thanks to this development, 22 watt sodium lasers and 589. So you see on the left, the four laser gas stars installed on the VLT and operating every night. Uh, so this is a, 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 a standard product for all observatories now, um, uh, which was developed by Toptica and PV. Uh, more recently, so ISO is still working to, in development with Toptica and PB and, and has achieved 63 watt laser which is a world record, so this is the image on the right, uh, which, is, which are of great interest for satellite communication. So we have actually another collaboration with ESA here, uh, which also in, is interested by this for, laser, uh, for satellite communication. And for us, we're also very interested to increase the degrees uh, uh, of correction of the AO. Uh, also, this uh, new laser power will enable new AO concept uh, with high uh, power, um, increase the sky coverage, maybe full sky coverage AO. So this is a, a, an area also that where we are active. Um, uh, in terms of infrared detectors, so um, for, for adaptive optics, we also need a fast, uh, uh, fast low noise detectors. So uh, we, have, we have developed together with company in UK, Leonardo in that case, uh, small EAPD uh, infrared array, so 320 by 256, which was absolutely fantastic uh, uh, to be used for gravity. Um, our VL VLT interferometer instrument. Um, more recently, we have put more effort in going to 512 by 512 pixels EAPD, 2 kilohertz frame rate. And this is really to prepare for the ELT uh, Planet Finder. I, I just presented before. So that, that detector is available, is in test, being tested. And, and the, the question is uh, whether we should push forward uh, uh, this technology, uh, 1K by 1K, 2K by 2K, uh, like NASA is doing. I think ESA also is doing uh, some, some work on this. Uh, so maybe uh, pushing forward uh, this technology uh, to 2K, 2K, or 4K, 4K uh, will also be interesting as an alternative to uh, RY4 RG uh, detectors in the US. So in conclusions, uh, there are several key technologies are needed to build state-of-the-art instrument for ground-based astronomy. So I mentioned a number of things. I didn't have the time to enter in all the details. For instance, I didn't talk about kinetic inductance detectors, uh, which are also very interesting, but uh, uh, really at the technology, technology readiness level relatively low. I talk about curved visible infrared detector, this infrared instrument, laser frequency comb, or ultra stable Fabry Perot. I uh, talk about high stability deformable mirror, laser sources, machine learning technique with high power real time computer, robust and high efficiency fiber for K band. Uh, we also need to secure the transmission rating availability for, for scientific application and not develop in this presentation, but definitely promising astrophotonics, for instance, for integrated optics, integrated petrograph space uh, is also interested by this, I guess, uh, TTIC sensing, heterodyne interferometry, and, and so forth. So I, I will stop here, and sorry for this uh, jump on the slides. 
Thank you, Norbert. It was really interesting and complete the presentation. We really hope that uh, European industry, now that the ELT will start procuring the constructions of the phase one instruments, uh, we hope that the that our industry will have a significant role there and also in the phase two instruments. So, so it, I think it was very, very, very interesting. So now we change the topic and we were going to look, take a look at the square kilometer array observatory. We all know that construction for the first phase of SKA has kicked off this year and the, they have the massive uh, objective of building the world's largest distributed radio telescope with three sites in three different continents. The project will bring forward immense technological advances in different technologies like RF receivers, advanced signal processing, or signal and data transport. And SKA, uh, similarly to ESO, also looks ahead and has set together a development program which will guide technologies to shape the future evolution of the observatory. So here with us is Tim, Tim Stevenson, who is the head of assurance of the SKA observatory. And here he's going to provide us this vision. Thank you so much, Tim. And the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I can't tell whether or not you can see the uh, presentation. We can't see it. Okay, I've got it. Uh, Mildly screwed up right now. <clears throat> Let me start again. Tim, if you need, I can share it from here. I think you should. It's not behaving in exactly the same it was a few months ago. So, okay, so I'm going to try to do it then. And you can tell me when to go ahead with the slides. Sure, so thank you, Javier. Uh, while you're sorting that out, uh, I'm Tim Stevenson. I'm head of assurance at the SKA Observatory. And I will spend a significant amount of time uh, introducing, thank you, Javier, in, introducing the SKO because we're a new uh, kid on the block, a new game in town, uh, and not much is known in the community about the SKA. And of course, that we are focused right now on construction and our technology development program is going to be somewhat in the future, but I'll give the timetable and the likely content of that uh, program. Uh, towards the end of this presentation. So, Javier, next slide. So, the SKO Observatory is the world's foremost radio astronomy observatory. We don't have any uh, scientific instrumentation assets yet, but we are in the process of building them. And once they are built, they will be the world's two largest radio telescopes. The headquarters of the organization of the, of the observatory, rather, are, are in the UK at Jodrell Bank which of course is one of the most famous uh, radio astronomy locations in the world. And we're the world's second treaty organization. In other words, a, an intergovernmental organization founded by a convention between nations. We're the world's second treaty organization after the European Southern Observatory. Uh, and we're the second organization, sorry, dedicated to astronomy after ESO. Our member states right now, and this is a dynamic situation, are Australia, China, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, South Africa, and the United Kingdom. Uh, by the end, end of me reading that list, we could even have another country. I mean, they're uh, queuing up to join the observatory. And we have now a coterie of collaborating uh, countries uh, and countries which are in the process of acceding to the convention. They are Canada, France, Germany, India, Spain, Sweden, and Switzerland. And we have two further observer state, states whose 
uh, move towards accession or a collaboration agreement with the observatory is not yet fully defined, and that's Japan and South Korea. So you can tell that the SK Observatory is already global. It, its reach is very great in terms of uh, astronomers across the planet. So the observatory is the design authority and operator of the world's two largest radio telescopes, as I've said, and I'm going to emphasize how large is large in a short while. Uh, but the two telescopes, the SK-1 low is 70 to 350 megahertz. SK-1 mid is 350 megahertz to 25 gigahertz. And they are made up of, in the case of low, 512 38 meter diameter um, stations of 256 long period of periodic antennas. Behind me, you see a, uh, an artist's impression of how one of those stations would look and the, uh, and the proximity in the core area of those, that station to other stations. Uh, and the uh, SK-1 mid uh, telescope is made up of 133 15 meter class dish antennas, uh, plus 64 antennas, which come from the Meerkat project, the South African uh, National Meerkat program, which is currently in operation there is a possibility that there will be a further 20 meerkat antennas at the time of integration of meerkat. Uh, so the total uh, will be maintained at 197. We'll just build less than 133 uh, additional antennas in SK-1 mid, but that additional 20 is, is yet to be uh, fully agreed. So the baselines, the longest baselines for these two telescopes are respectively 63 kilometer for SK-1 low, and 150 kilometers for SK-1 mid. And they are built in uh, radio quiet zones, which are protected by law in South Africa and in Australia. In South Africa, it is in, uh, SK-1 mid is built in the Karoo, which is in the Northern Cape province of South Africa. In Australia, SK-1 low is built in the Shire of Murchison, which is a, uh, a um, um, administrative district in Western Australia. At the initial 10 year investment in the construction and operation of uh, the SK telescopes is 2 billion euros. Javier, next slide. So, just the usual artist's impressions. And in fact, these are uh, a composite of artist's impressions and what you can actually see on the site sites now. On the left hand side is the Australian site uh, with one of the SK1 low stations, the 38 meter stations made up of, of, of 256 log periodic antennas in the foreground. But in the background, you can see a dish antenna, which is not part of the SK uh, at this time. It's the Australian national program, ASCAP, which is currently in operation. It's been in operation for a number of years, and it is technologically advanced because at the focal point of these antennas, there is a phased array. And this is a potential uh, development for the SKA telescope in South Africa much later in the lifetime of the observatory. And on the right hand side is an artist's impression of the SKA dishes in the core area, they're close to each other in the core area, uh, in the Karoo in South Africa. And as I say, these are artist impressions because we've only just started construction. And as I've said before, it's very important for those of you listening to understand that we will not have a technology development program of any large investment until the focus moves away from construction over the next eight years or so. So Javier, next slide. So this is uh, the usual Google Earth view. And this is a Google Earth view of Meerkat, which is, very, uh, which is sighted very close to where the core will be for SK-1 mid in South Africa, simply because it will be integrated. And because of the, the way that the the interferometer ought to be laid out, the configuration of the interferometer. You can't build an interferometer into another interferometer without making them concentric. So the center for SK-1 mid will be very close to the center of what you see here for Meerkat. So hopefully, Javier, if you make a, if you click now, you will give an indication of the geography of the SKA. So we're zooming out from the South African location and we're moving across the Indian Ocean to the location in Australia where the 
center of SK1 low will be. There's nothing there right now. Uh, now, this is a, uh, a map of that area. So the center of the previous image as we landed in Australia is the center of this image. And as you can see on here, there are uh, green lines. Those green lines are the roads that we will have to build to link up the stations of uh, SK1 low. And the, uh, that is a few hundred kilometers of tracks. Now you're beginning to get an impression of the scale now. You may also be able to see the red uh, roads on here. There are no tarmac roads in this area. These are all dirt roads. And we will be adding dirt roads and fiber connectivity, and in many cases, power uh, laid along those roads to link up these stations. But you can see uh, from looking at the green lines that it's a spiral formation. It's a, it's a um, uh, a dense core area and then three spiral arms where the spacing between stations increases logarithmic as you go along the arms. Now the size of this, it should be beginning to understand that the blue line that you can see is, is a station. Now this is a sheep station as originally uh, defined in, in the Australian uh, agricultural economy and that is a very large area but I'm going to tell you how big an area it is shortly. The next to it, there is the white boundary, which is actually another sheep station. Sheep stations are, are tens of thousands of square kilometers. So if we go to the next slide, that is a zoom out again. I'm sure you're beginning to feel a little travel sick from these movements, but that's a zoom out. You can see the blue boundary again, which is the sheep station. And the yellow boundary is the Shire of Murchison, which is the government unit in which the entire observe, uh, the entire uh, telescope will fit. But that, that, that Shire of Murchison, whose population is roughly 100 people, is about 10% bigger than the, the Netherlands. So you now get a measure of just how big the uh, low telescope is. I'm not going to do the same thing for mid because we don't have the time, but there is a similar large scale. Now, from a technology development perspective, I think everyone will understand that this, the absolute sheer scale of these telescopes bring their own technological um, uh, challenges. One of them is, is of course the connectivity between stations. So at the moment it's optical fibers, it will probably always be optical fibers, but there's always an opportunity when the receptors at each of these stations begin to increase, uh, begin to generate more data. In the case of mid, once you go to phased arrays, you will now be generating much more data and you will need to increase the connectivity capacity. And we will, we will need new technology perhaps to do that. And the other side of this uh, equation in relation to, to the scale of the telescopes is power. And here we have already taken the decision to uh, use autonomous power, uh, uh, in this case, uh, photovoltaic uh, systems to power the outer stations. And as everyone knows, photovoltaic power is not particularly efficient and technological advances in the efficiency of power of, 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 of photovoltaic arrays would be very attractive to us in the years to come. Also, photovoltaic arrays are not radio quiet. They need to be screened. In fact, a photovoltaic array, the array of cells themselves act as a giant antenna radiating all the, all the electrical mess that's going on in the converters and so on in these power stations. So improvements in the way that photovoltaic arrays are managed so that they are more radio quiet is another attractive idea. So these are very basic, very simple ideas that come from the way that we have already designed the telescopes. So if we go to the next slide. So this is rather hard to see, and I'm just going to show the two schematics of the two telescopes. This is mid. And MID is the one that I think most people would recognize as a radio telescope, or at least as a radio, an, an interferometer. It's an array of dishes with a suite of receivers in each dish, with, with one receiver selected for each dish every, at any one time. So at the top of the block is the standard signal path, which is a, a receiver uh, uh, sitting on a dish with the usual RF arrangement such that it, what is produced 
uh, by that dish is a voltage time series, but with a control system for pointing the antenna and so forth. And there are, as I've said, in mid 197 of these dishes. And then to, to go to the block below, because I haven't got a cursor, I can't point to it, but the block at the bottom part of the screen here is, is the uh, means to form beams to correlate uh, the output of the dishes uh, and then to, to, to um, move that data to a computing facility where the, in, the, the products that astronomers are ultimately interested in are produced. So it's a very simple model in, this, in the sense that you have an array of receptors, you have a correlated beam former, and you have uh, computing facilities to produce the data products. And that is a model that is repeated with low. If we move to the next slide. But with the exception that the, the beam forming is done in multiple stages, initially in two stages, uh, in the, uh, so you can beam form on an individual station. The station, as you can see behind me, you can form beams on that station. Uh, and then you can subsequently form a beam of the beams uh, at, at a central facility. So the, the, the complexity of the, um, uh, aperture array, the SK1 low, is significantly higher than it is for the dish-based array, SK1 mid. Uh, and that brings technological challenges. And so I'm sure you've got by now an appreciation that any improvement in computing technology would be very attractive to make both the, the um, uh, efficiency, the throughput of our telescopes better, but also to enable new science cases. So we move to the next slide. So the development program, as I've said, is, is somewhat delayed from now. It is not in place now. It, there is no activity on it right now. And most importantly, I think for this audience, there is no funding available at this point. But what we've proposed is that the expenditure on the technology development program over the next 10 years is 40 million euros, which I think is a significant and important sum uh, to make sure that we keep up to date with the technology enhancements in the SKA telescopes, that will be expended, uh, that 40 million will be expended from 2022 to 2032, but it starts very slowly. It's not 4 million euros a year, it's considerably less uh, in 2022, but it will ramp up to the point where it will be 20 million a year after 2032. And that's a very healthy uh, um, uh, technology development uh, budget for, for, uh, for the observatory. Now, uh, the funding, uh, this funding uh, uh, will go only to member states, uh, which is a clear decision on the part of our council uh, that we would not be funding technology which would not be developed outside our member states. And it is largely on a co-funded basis. And I'll show a diagram shortly you know, to show how that would work. But the costs of developments within the development program are shared between the observatory and member states in general. Now, the, the downside, I've been talking about the idea that there are attractive enhancements to be made to the telescopes once they are built and in operation. However, the history of the SKO has been such that there has been a, um, a one or two episodes of descoping from the original vision. And it has been determined that there are some possibilities that what we have built by 2032 is something that is at a scope which is still calling out to be um, enhanced to the, at least to, to, to a, one of the previous visions for the SK. So some of this money will be spent on restoring descopes that have taken place over later years. And that obviously um, uh, reduces the amount of money for new technology. The new capabilities which would come from the technology development program are a synthesis of a science roadmap and a technology roadmap. I think everyone here knows that what happens in the development of research infrastructures is that there are new, sciences, new science cases coming along for which there is no technology. And there are new technologies that come along for which there are no science cases. And what we want to do is to combine the two things to make sure that we never spend money on technology nobody needs. And we never, we never have an ambition to do science for which technology is not being developed. 
So the roadmap idea is absolutely key, and these roadmaps are being worked on uh, as I speak. So it is to do with, in the science case, looking for new targets of interest and new phenomena of interest. And in the technology case, it's the better ways of meeting requirements. So we move to the next slide, which is quite complex, and I see probably nobody can read it. Ah, it seems to have rotated through 90 degrees again. Oh yeah, you've got the old version. Anyway, all right, well, that will prevent anybody from actually reading it, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll tell you what the concept is. So the idea, the seed for the technology development program for the SKA is that there are technology development projects which may only be driven by the availability of new technology or new science cases happening in the member countries. That's happening constantly anyway. And the idea is that at a certain level of maturity, those projects become eligible for bidding for the funding from the SK Observatory Development Program. And they will be, they must be on the, on the SK Observatory roadmaps at the time that they are selected for funding. And they will be funded at a low level initially to improve their technological, uh, uh, you're distracting Michelle by doing that. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, by, uh, they will have to meet this level of maturity, which is appropriate to get onto the roadmap. They will then be funded, funded at a low level to improve their maturity before they become a large project, attracting more funding. And obviously there is a sort of fractal uh, structure to the way that the SKA will fund um, uh, such projects. There will be a, 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 a number of small projects, and, but a smaller number of larger projects as they progress. And on the far right-hand side, which is supposed to be the top of this diagram, would be the point at which a technology qualifies to be develop, developed, to be incorporated into the SK telescopes. And that is, a, that is a point at which it becomes a rather more industrialized project. So in terms of the participation of industry in this process, industry of course can be involved in the nationally funded development programs as a supporter, as a technological supporter. But there is, I think traditionally, not a lot of profit to be made in doing that but it keeps you in the game. And then industry stays involved during the latter stages of development of a technology, assisting and certainly facilitating the maturity of the improvement of technology as a candidate to be incorporated into SK telescopes. And then the time comes at the top of this diagram or the right-hand side is when the development has moved to the point where it's sufficiently mature to be industrialized for incorporation into the telescopes and industry has a big role to play there. So I think it's the usual research infrastructure flow and we are adopting the same thing, but we will make it open to industry at the point where the technology is mature enough and has been selected for actual incorporation into the SK telescopes. So if you move to the next slide, I'm probably spending far too much time on this. This is, a list of the key technologies that simply in a hand wavy fashion have been identified as areas of focus for a future, uh, for a technology development program from the observatory. So additional receiver bands, that's obvious. We, we currently are going to deploy three uh, and there are space on the indexes in mid for five. So without changing the design of the structure of the dishes, there is, a possibility for new receivers. And those receivers can in incorporate technology which is more current in, in perhaps five, six, seven years time. Uh, in, and, and in particular, we will be looking for increased instantaneous RF bandwidth. So wideband feeds are, are definitely on our shopping list for future enhancements. More sensitivity, obviously, and the easiest way to do that is to go for more stations or more dishes, but also to improve the noise performance of current receivers. Uh, improving the, the, the block of electronics that does digitization, correlation, and beam forming. Obviously, marches in technology forward will, uh, will, will uh, give us opportunities there. And the list is there. I, can't, I won't go through it because the time doesn't really allow it. But there are particular areas where we might be interested in uh, improvements, uh, which I would like to pick out. One is improved resilience to RFI. 
even though we are in a, um, a, a radio quiet zone, we still have space-based and high altitude sources, which are not, uh, we are not protected by law from those and uh, improving our resilience against RFI from those sources uh, would be highly desirable. Phased array feeds I've already mentioned, the, the ability to form more station beams uh, and more tide rain beams is, is highly desirable. Longer baselines, obviously, that's very easy to achieve. Uh, improved algorithms uh, for RFI rejection um, and uh, direction independent calibration for, for low, that's, that's really highly desirable. Um, and we're not sure we have a capability to do it right now. Um, and better use of telescope time, uh, in particular, the scheduling in response to external events, triggers which might involve moving from one class of observation to another class of observation, better uh, uh, capturing of transients, um, better access to the enormous volume of data, which I could have talked about, but I didn't, that, that SK-1 generates, and environmental monitoring. Those things that influence our observations, uh, we, we would like to be able to observe and model better than we in the current design. So I'll stop there um, and I will uh, obviously be here to answer the questions at the end of the session. Apologies again for the two great embarrassments of that presentation. Thank, Thank you, Tim. Thank you for the presentation. It's really understandable that SKAO is focusing on construction now, and no doubt there will be challenges in construction, which will be for the, there will, you will have to find solutions with industry, but it's also nice to know that you are foreseeing this development program for the future. So um, we are on time. And next we have uh, my colleague, Manuel Collados. He works in the Institute de Astrofisica de Canarias. Manuel Collado is the PI of the European Solar Telescope, which is a next generation large aperture so solar telescope with a 4.2 meter primary mirror. It will be optimized for studies of the magnetic coupling of the solar telescope. You all know that the EST will be built in the island of La Palma, which is sadly in the news these days, as you know, due to the volcano. And we would like from the organizing committee to express all su our support to all the inhabitants of La Palma and hope it's over soon. Anyway, the EST is an ESPRI project since 2016 and is already in the procurement stage of several subsystems. So Manuel, thanks for taking us through the, the different technologies and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Javier. Let me share my screen. You see it? Fine. Okay. Let's see if I can. Put this thing here. Okay. Um, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present uh, the European Solar Telescope EST at this uh, this forum. EST, we can say that uh, represents the future of the European solar astronomy. During the last uh, decades, uh, European a number of European countries have been operating solar telescopes, uh, the largest ones uh, uh, built uh, uh, here in the observatories of the Canary Islands. They are more than 20 or 30 years old. They, we have uh, exploited them to the, to the maximum. They are reaching the end uh, of their lifetime and solar physics is demanding a more powerful infrastructure that can answer all the scientific uh, questions that are appearing uh, recently. And EST is uh, aiming at uh, answering these uh, needs and questions that we are having now. So now I'm talking in the, uh, on behalf of the whole EST team, which is a very large fraction of uh, the solar physics community in Europe. Uh, with its uh, 4.2 uh, primary mirror, 4.2 meter primary mirror, uh, EST will be by far the largest solar telescope that has ever built uh, uh, Europe uh, up to now. Now we can say that uh, EST has three large 
three, uh, three goals. On the one hand, we want to observe the, the sun with the best spatial resolution. And the larger the primary mirror, the larger the collecting area, then the better we can observe this, uh, the, the, the sun. This is necessary because even if we can, we have the idea that uh, the sun produces large scale uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, these, the roots of these large scale phenomena, they lie on the very small uh, uh, scale phenomena uh, and features. That's why we want to, uh, we usually, take solar telescopes at the highest spatial resolution they can, they can uh, provide. On the second hand, we all know that the magnetic field is responsible for most uh, of the uh, solar phenomena. We all know these uh, CMEs, uh, the mass ejections and flares, etc. They are all uh, the roots they are lie in the existence and the uh, interaction of the magnetic field with uh, with the plasma of, of the sun. These two images represent a, a sunspot group as it is seen in the visible images and in polarization. And polarization tells us about uh, about the magnetic field, and this is where we obtain the information of what is going on about this, uh, 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 about this uh, phenomena. And on the third place, uh, we have an ambitious plan to have a number of instruments that will operate simultaneously for multi-wavelength imaging and spectral imagery to get all this required information at a, at a fine scale, at a small scale, and also about the magnetic field. All these, these three aspects are the most important part of the of, of BST. Just to say that uh, the telescope is uh, promoted and uh, developed by the European Association for Solar Telescopes, uh, EAST. This is an association that gathers uh, 29 institutions all over Europe from 18 European countries, those shaded in blue in the in the map. We have all agreed that the best uh, uh, location to put the, uh, to install the telescope is in the Canary Islands. Here there are two observatories. And finally, uh, the, the, uh, the telescope will be installed at uh, La Palma. This is a decision that was taken uh, early this, this year. Uh, as Javier has said, uh, EST entered the S3 roadmap uh, European Strategic Infrastructure Roadmap in 2016. Now we are in what is called the preparatory phase. Uh, now I will mention in a moment what this preparatory phase mean, means. Uh, we expect to start construction around uh, end 23 and uh, beginning of 24. Construction will last uh, for about uh, six years until 2018, 2019. And at that moment, we expect to enter the commissioning phase and around 2030 or something like that, we expect to enter a regular operation phase. This is a distribution of the construction budget. The construction budget uh, is uh, around 220 million euros. This is how it is distributed in the, in the different areas. So they somehow overlap in some parts that you can have an idea of how the budget is distributed. An important part comes from the, from the instruments and uh, from the optics, but also mechanics and other uh, and control represents an important part of the, of the uh, distribution of the, uh, of, of the budget. In the present preparatory phase, the objectives that we have is, on the one hand, we have uh, consolidated our project office uh, team. It took us some time until we have uh, collected the uh, adequate set of people to, uh, to, to, run the, to run the project. Presently, we have about 30 people in this project office uh, centralized in the, uh, in the Canary Islands. 
uh, other people are working uh, at the partners headquarters in the district all over Europe, but the central team is, is here, and as I say, about 30 people. And uh, the conceptual design of the project was finished in 10 years ago, in 2011. Uh, since then, the science has made progress and new questions have uh, come up. Uh, uh, technology has also evolved, and now uh, we are in the, uh, we have addressed the, the issues of the uh, revising uh, the uh, the design in terms of science objectives and also in terms of technology achievements, and uh, we have now. Uh, modified the initial conceptual design to accommodate all uh, these needs. The, it is more or less uh, uh, already uh, updated. And uh, we are now facing the telescope preliminary design. This, uh, the final, this preliminary design is expected to be finished in one year from now, calls for tender have been open for this. Uh, some of them have already been uh, assigned to, to different companies and some of them are, are open at, the, uh, at this moment, but we expect to have the, this preliminary design finished uh, in, in one year. Site selection was an uh, important uh, aspect for the, for the project. And as I mentioned uh, before, La Palma has been, uh, the Observatory of the Rockwell's Muchachos has been uh, selected for, to host the facility. And uh, until the end of this preliminary phase in one, two years from now, we, uh, we will produce the specifications for the detailed design and construction to be started in two, three years from now. We have to, uh, make the uh, environmental impact study uh, to start with all the construction permits with the local authorities and also produce the final construction plan and course book in, uh, by the end of next, uh, next year. This is a view of the La Palma Observatory, the Rocco de los Muchachos Observatory. Here we can see the William Herschel telescope, the 4.2 meter uh, nighttime telescope. Here too, we can see two very famous uh, solar telescopes, the Swedish telescope and the Dutch telescope. They have been operating for almost 30 years, the two, uh, two of them. They have produced most of the best uh, data ever obtained at the solar telescope. And EST will be located here in this area that has proved to be one of the best uh, all over the world to host uh, solar observations. The, uh, just to give you an idea of what the uh, telescope looks like, here's a, a movie showing the uh, light path at telescope level. The telescope is very simple with just a primary and a secondary mirror and, uh, uh, and four mirrors that are located behind M1. These four mirrors are used to define the elevation and azimuth axis as usually in a telescope, but we have duplicated them instead of having just two mirrors, we have four mirrors here. And these four mirrors, they are intended for two additional things apart from defining the uh, main uh, axis of the, for the motion of the telescope. On the one hand, they will be used or multi-conjugate adaptive optics. It is very important that uh, uh, adaptive optics is uh, working at uh, with its maximum performance to reach the best spatial resolution and in the largest uh, possible uh, field of view. In that sense, EST is intended to have the most powerful adaptive optics system ever thought for a solar, for a solar telescope. On the one hand, there will be the secondary mirror. The secondary mirror uh, uh, is intended to be an adaptive uh, mirror. This will be the first uh, uh, adaptive uh, mirror installed at uh, a solar telescope as a secondary, as a secondary mirror. And on the other hand, these four mirrors, they, they will also be the formable mirrors. Uh, uh, so that these five uh, uh, deformable mirrors 
will be able or we expect that they will be able to compensate for the uh, uh, turbulence of uh, caused by the by the air uh, of the of the earth uh, atmosphere so these six mirrors then uh, after uh, the light has uh, uh, been reflected on them and then light goes through the azimuth ax axis to the to the lab uh, just to mention the uh, ongoing works uh, for the for the for the telescope, there were there are three there are, three, there are uh, four packages that have been uh, uh, defined. On the one hand, there is the telescope structure itself. Then there is the primary mirror, then there is the adaptive secondary mirror, and an important part that is the uh, heat injector. In the sense that uh, uh, EST will be uh, will have a Gaussian configuration, so, uh, there will be a focus. And the primary focus will be produced between the two, uh, the primary and the secondary mirror, and there uh, most of the light coming from the sun will be rejected, and only the field of view which is of interest for for, for EST will be transmitted to the secondary mirror and the rest of, of, of the optics. The primary mirror itself uh, is, a, uh, is a challenge. A 4.2 mirror uh, might not seem uh, a, large, uh, a large mirror, but uh, um, we need to have in, in, in mind that we are observing the sun. Thermal issues are uh, very important. And uh, um, here we have the most important parts of this uh, primary mirror. They, then we will have the, the, the bank, the, we will have the mechanical actuators to control the deformation of the, of the bank, uh, especially due to, to, to gravity, but not only. Then there will be the thermal control of, the, uh, uh, of this mirror so that its uh, temperature is kept within plus minus half a degree with respect to the ambient uh, temperature. And then there will be the, the, the cell that will host all these, uh, the, uh, all these uh, units. Uh, in the case of the heat rejector between the primary and the secondary mirror, this, we can say that this is the critical point of the, of the, of the telescope because this is where all the light and all the heat collected by the primary mirror is concentrated. Uh, the concept is that in the focal plane, the primary focal plane, we will put uh, a small, a small mirror. Most of it will reflect the light to uh, to the outside, and will not be will not be used. But you can imagine that the 15 kilowatts recorded by the uh, uh, received by the uh, collected by the primary mirror, they will be. Uh, concentrated in a small area of 30 uh, millimeters, so the heat uh, the heat concentration here is, is very large. Uh, as I say, only a small part of the field of view will be transmitted here in the, to the secondary mirror, and most of the of the of the light will be rejected. The uh, the cooling system of this uh, heat rejector is critical, and then uh, we we will. Uh, inject cold air to the back of the, of the mirror, and then the warm uh, air will be collected through these pipes that will have to be uh, uh, channeled through this spider that has to be very narrow, and then to the, to the uh, structure of the telescope. So this is a critical part. Uh, the cold pretender for this heat rejector is presently open and we invite all companies uh, that are interested in this to apply for its, uh, its design. As I say, the, uh, the adaptive uh, secondary mirror is also a key point of the, of the telescope because this will be the first time a solar telescope will have such a, such a deformable mirror. It will have a diameter of 800 millimeters and with uh, 2,000 uh, actuators. No mirror of this size and of this density and with the stroke and pitch that we require has uh, ever been built, and we are working in that uh, in that uh, direction. And the uh, final uh, elements of this uh, telescope structure are N3 to M6. This, as I said, not only produces the elevation and azimuth axis, 
but are also the complement of the M2 for MCAO uh, for optic optics uh, correction. These are the four mirrors that are uh, foreseen. And uh, the control of these uh, mirrors it represents a challenge. We will need to do a lot of numerical simulations. We will, do to, we will need to do a lot of laboratory experiments to define the best strategy for the, for the control. We have presently at the IEC uh, an optical bench uh, at the laboratory that reproduces, uh, the idea is to reproduce this uh, uh, AO system and to study all these, uh, all these uh, features of the adaptive optics system. Uh, uh, in addition to this, or any, uh, any, we have to take into account that any uh, surface, the telescope structure, and should have a temperature that should not be different from ambient temperature uh, by uh, plus or minus half a degree. So the control of all this uh, telescope system has to be very strict in terms of uh, in terms of temperature. And then I have, and another thing that uh, characterizes uh, uh, EST is that it will have an open enclosure so that wind can go through the telescope structure freely and remove the turbulence that it produced here from by the, after the heating uh, um, produced by, by the sun. And uh, the, the, the dome will have a, a diameter of about 30 meters. And we are also looking for alternatives for this, for this, for this dome. Inside uh, uh, the, the building, inside the pier, there will be uh, what we call the uh, pier optical path. This, was, this is only a vacuum tube that channels the, uh, the, uh, the light from the telescope up and down to the instrument uh, uh, room. And there we will have several uh, floors where the instruments that I will describe uh, in a minute will be uh, installed. So from now on, uh, the telescope itself is already running with the post tender that I mentioned. And now from in the coming years, we will concentrate on the, on the instruments. Uh, and the light is coming from the telescope. We will divide the light into four arms. First, we will divide the light into the visible and the near infrared arm. And each of these two arms will be divided in, uh, uh, into two additional arms, one for the blue, green, and then to the red, uh, uh, to the red, and on the other hand, in the, the region up to one micron, and then above uh, one micron, uh, 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 above one micron. Each of these arms uh, will host uh, an imaging uh, uh, instrument, instrument and a spectrograph, and they will all be operating simultaneously. And the development of these instruments uh, are a challenge in the sense that no instrument is presently working at any sort of telescope with the, with the uh, requirements that we have for PST. Just to mention a few of the challenges that these uh, uh, instruments uh, represent, uh, let me say that for the imaging instruments, they, they will be based on Fabi Perot interferometers. These interferometers need to have, uh, uh, these are two parallel uh, glass plates that uh, uh, whose distance is very small, be, uh, below one millimeter, and, they, and who, that is changed with a very uh, uh, large accuracy. The diameter of these uh, uh, glass plates is of the order of 200 uh, millimeters. And uh, uh, keeping the parallelism and uh, granting the motion of these uh, plates is uh, very challenging. And with them, we want to, uh, we can select the wavelength, we observe the sun, and we can tune with this wavelength with time. So the idea is that we have a DST, three instruments uh, like this operating simultaneously and uh, uh, and giving us this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of images. Manuel, uh, two minutes, sorry, okay. Okay, yes, I will finish in two or three minutes. Uh, on the other hand, the, we will have the uh, spectrographs. Uh, uh, there will be four of them. The, uh, they will be based on the integral field uh, uh, spectroscopy and also for, for polarimetry. 
And uh, presently, we have been working on two techniques. Uh, on the one hand, on, on based on image slices, these are the uh, these images uh, show the results uh, from the prototypes that we have built for the present operating telescopes. The results are very uh, uh, encouraging, and it, the heart of the instruments is this point here. This shows the slices. The slices are presently 100 microns wide, and now we are working to produce as slices 30 microns uh, wide. Uh, and with this, we illuminate the, uh, the spectrograph. And also the other alternative is based on micro lenses. This is another, the, 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 I show here the results of a prototype that they built for the Swedish tower. And uh, uh, the requirements for this are also very tight and still this instrument does not require. So this micro lens option is the uh, uh, the second uh, uh, option for the for the instruments, and once the instruments have been defined, we will start working on the second generation that could be used uh, uh, to replace the present instruments or installed uh, in additional parts of the of the four arms that we have. So, just in summary, the technologies that we will require for for EST are related to macro optomechanics or the telescope itself micro optomechanics in terms of the slices and the, and the, uh, and the micro lenses. Also the Fabi Perot can, uh, can, can be uh, considered as micro optomechanics because they have to be um, handled with a, law, a, a very large accuracy. And we will need all kinds of optomechanical uh, elements for sure to, uh, to host of the all the, all the optical elements. Thermal control will be a, a, a challenge. We will need a large uh, format, uh, high speed uh, uh, sensors that are not recently available at the, at the market. We are aiming at 6K per 6K, 30 frames per second detectors. We are working in that direction. Data handling will be an issue because we expect to collect between 50 and 100 terabytes per, per day at the observatory. Part of this will be uh, uh, um, uh, operated or uh, reduced at the observatory, and most of them they will be uh, sent to the databases at the, uh, at the, at the European uh, uh, centers. And from there, we will uh, open them to the community through virtual observatories, and all this will uh, will represent uh, 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 also a challenge in terms of uh, IT technologies. And for sure, there will be services uh, like uh, coolant, air conditioning, etc., that will be needed uh, uh, for the for the telescope. So here I show you just the contact points in terms of mail and web page, etc., and the funding contributors up to up to the moment. And with this, I. I, I finished and I'm looking forward for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel, for the presentation. I think it was very interesting to know about the plans, the construction plans, but also the instrumentation and possibilities for industry as well. So now uh, we have our final presentation. I am very happy to welcome Wolfgang Wild, who is the project manager of the Cherenkov Telescope Array Observatory, CTAO. CTAO is the next generation ground-based observatory for gamma ray astronomy at very high energies. It is a, it's a distributed research infrastructure under construction, and it has sensors located both in the northern and southern hemispheres. We have fields like computing, manufacturing of extremely sensitive cameras and drive systems, which can be in, of interest to the industry. And this is BSBS first collaboration with CTA, and I welcome Wolfgang to present their plans. Thank you, Wolfgang. Thank you, Javier, for the introduction, and thank you for inviting us to uh, present something here. Let me try to share my screen. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, good morning, everybody, and good evening to those who are sitting further east, uh, Asia, Australia or so. 
Um, I'll give you an overview of uh, the Cherenkov of Telescope Array Observatory, where we stand, what the idea is, and a few words about key technologies. So as Javier already said, the Cherenkov Telescope Array is a next generation ground-based observatory for gamma ray astronomy at very high frequency, very high energies. It's basically another window into the universe uh, where in addition to optical and radio astronomy uh, or solar astronomy, what we just heard, uh, we're looking at uh, very high energetic photons and gamma radiation sounds a little bit dangerous sometimes because it's also part of, uh, of uh, radioactive processes, but it's nothing else than high energy electromagnetic radiation. In a sense, it's equivalent to light, but with very high energy. Now that uh, radiation originates in the universe through a whole variety of processes. And uh, we can observe that from the ground, not directly because the atmosphere uh, blocks these high energy uh, photons, but we can observe it through an indirect process. And that's the Cherenkov effect, which was discovered by Pavel Cherenkov, a Russian physicist. Uh, he discovered that in 1934, he received the Nobel prize uh, later for that. And it's basically the process is when a high energetic uh, light particle, a, a gamma photon, uh, hits the atmosphere, it creates a whole shower of secondary particles. They travel so fast in the atmosphere that they emit a blue uh, flash uh, of, of blue light, a flash of blue light, a few nanoseconds long. If you've ever seen a nuclear reactor uh, with, the, uh, um, with the elements in, in, a, in a bath, uh, you have, may have noticed this blue light, that's Cherenkov radiation. And so what we detect from Earth is very short flashes of extremely faint blue light uh, with kind of optical telescopes. And, and that then allows to uh, infer what the original uh, particle was. Now, the current plan is that we will build 64 telescopes at two sites, one in the northern, one in the southern hemisphere, so complete sky coverage. And with that, uh, CTA will be much larger, more sensitive than existing instruments. There are a few instruments existing, one in La Palma, one in Namibia, another one in the US. Uh, but what we do is the next step uh, to make it bigger and more powerful. Now, CTA being a fairly large project is designed and built in a large international collaboration in our current legal entity, which is a, a GmbH according to German law. We have 11 countries and lots of institutes involved. We have a telescope consortia, like for example, the large size telescope that has at least 35 institutes from Japan to Europe and, and uh, pretty much all over the world. So it's a very large international collaboration. And the legal entity uh, that is responsible for building and operating the facility is called the Cherenkov Telescope Array Observatory with the legal form of a German uh, limited liability company, but it's in the process of becoming an ERIC. That's a European Union legal entity, European Research Infrastructure Consortium, uh, and will have its headquarters in, in Bologna, Italy, where I'm physically located. We have four sites, as I said, uh, two array sites. The northern site is in Spain on the island of La Palma uh, on, on top of the mountain. Uh, the southern site will be in the Atacama Desert in, in Chile on land of, of ESO. Then we have the headquarters that uh, are currently still in Heidelberg in Germany, but they will move to Italy, um, hosted by ENOF in, in Bologna. And we will have a science data management center in Zeuthen, that's just outside of Berlin uh, in, in Germany. Uh, so a fairly distributed project, uh, similar to SKA in distribution, but certainly not in size. Uh, we're much smaller, but it's, it's uh, not just one site, uh, but uh, several. Now, here's a picture of the site, uh, the northern site in La Palma, Spain. It's at the Observatorio Roque de los Muchachos, which is an existing observatory with many telescopes, and in the future also the solar telescope. And below, you see an artist's conception. The two white telescopes here do actually exist. These are the magic telescopes for the same uh, purpose. And what we want to put there is four of these very large telescopes and nine of medium-sized telescopes, and actually one of the telescopes. Uh, the, uh, that one in, in the circle here, it does exist, it has been built. And so that's uh, being operated as we speak. That's an aerial picture of the southern side uh, on, on Isoland, where you, in the lower left you see the existing observatory uh, Paranal with the VLTs, uh, four VLTs. 
Then in the middle, at Cerro Amazonas, the ELT is being built as we speak. And, and uh, we saw some pictures from Nobert Huguin. And we're in the valley here, basically between these two mountain ranges, the valley of several square kilometers where we will put uh, 54 telescopes in the future. Construction has not started yet on the southern side. Now, one slide about the technology in a nutshell. Uh, what we're trying uh, with CTA is to image very faint light flashes that are only a few nanoseconds long, 5, 10, 20 nanoseconds. And they are so uh, faint that we cannot see them with our eyes. If we could, we didn't need uh, cameras, but they are very sensitive cameras that can see it. And to cover the whole energy range, um, one has concluded that we need three different telescope diameters. And we call them large size telescope that has a primary mirror of 23 meters, medium sized with 12 meters and small sized with four meters. And they're optimized for different energy ranges uh, to do the, the science appropriately. Each of these telescopes will have a very sensitive camera with many pixels, order of 2000 or so for imaging. And the detector technology is both uh, traditional multi photomultiplier tubes and the new technology silicon photo photomultipliers. They convert basically the incoming uh, blue light flashes into electrical electronic signal, which then can be analyzed. Now to uh, detect and also correlate uh, or, or conclude um, these single events uh, with a precision of nanoseconds, we need very accurate timing and a clock over the whole array. So, so actually what the telescopes do is then when they think they have an event that's scientifically interesting, they send a trigger to the central software telling the central software, I think I have something. And if another telescope at the same time says also, I think I have an interesting trigger here, then these images are downloaded and, and analyzed. Um, there are challenging calibration techniques and algorithm. Why is that? Because unlike to radio astronomy or optical astronomy, where one would like to get rid of the atmosphere, here in CTA, the atmosphere is part of the detector, which is scientifically speaking, a little bit of a nightmare because you cannot control the, the atmosphere. Uh, that's where the incoming gamma radiation is converted into these Cherenko flashes. So one has to understand the atmosphere. And this means uh, a whole range of all sky cameras, LIDARs, weather stations, illuminators, atmospheric models, just to understand what happens uh, in, in the atmosphere. And so that leads to uh, quite elaborate calibration techniques and algorithms. And then last not least, since uh, there is lots of data coming in, these cameras, they make pictures at the rate of several kilohertz. So it's like a photographic camera with several thousands of pic pictures per second, uh, but only one event in roughly 10,000 is, is scientifically interesting. So it's a very different detection scheme to radio or optical astronomy. It's basically uh, looking for the needle in a haystack. And that is done with software means with uh, automatic uh, pipelines and so forth. It results in a fairly large amount of data. We expect something like four petabytes uh, of data products per year, which with today's uh, computing resources is manageable. And that may grow as the cameras uh, may become bigger. Now here are pictures of existing telescopes. On the left side, there's a small size telescopes, four meter, and there's a prototype in Sicily, Italy, uh, in, in operation and being tested. Uh, the plan is to build 37 of these units at CTA South only. So no SSTs at CTA North for, for scientific reasons. Then the medium sized telescope with a diameter of 12 meter uh, will be placed on both. Uh, and here you see a prototype uh, that has been built and tested in, in Berlin, in Germany. It's been disassembled now, but there were several years of uh, good testing campaign. And there we plan to put nine of these telescopes in the north side, so on La Palma, and 14 uh, in Chile. And last but not least, the very big telescopes, and here you see a picture of this LST. It has a 23 meter diameter. Uh, the first unit is built at La Palma, and that's the picture up there, and it's being commissioned. There will be another three uh, in La Palma and in a second stage, another four in Chile. And those are optimized for the low energy range. So with this suite of uh, telescopes, we can cover quite a high range of scientifically interesting uh, phenomena. Of course, the detection is done in the cameras and you see there has been a lot of uh, development in the cameras. They range from fairly small and compact like the one at the lower left, uh, that's a camera for the SST and that's about 50 by 50 centimeters or so, so it fits on a table. 
at the other extreme on the lower right, you see here a camera that is a picture from, from Madrid. It's, a, it's the LST camera before shipping it to, to La Palma. And you see that's about three by three meters and is something like two or three tons. So substantial hardware that is then in the, in the prime focus and in the full range. Uh, and, and here you see in the middle some of these uh, tubes, photomultiplier tubes with, uh, with um, light collectors. And so these cameras, they are high, high speed electronics, basically, as I said, uh, taking pictures at several kilohertz. They have a real time uh, pattern recognition built in to filter out the scientifically interesting uh, um, events. Uh, it has trigger mechanisms, coordination, uh, timing, and so forth. So quite elaborate uh, devices, those are. Now, where do we stand with CTA? Um, in the north in La Palma, construction has started. And so the design contracts for infrastructure, power, roads, foundations, and so forth, the second step uh, have been placed. And one large size telescope has been built. And you see the picture that is existing. There has been an inauguration with the presence of dignitaries uh, a while ago. And that telescope is now being commissioned and, and um, produces data. And it, it works very well, very beautiful telescope. In the south, uh, things are a little bit later. Um, we will place the first infrastructure contract very soon, building the access road uh, just to get to the site. Um, and so that should happen early next year uh, when we build a few kilometers of road. And that will then be followed by more infrastructure. We need uh, more than 50 foundations, interconnection roads, power system, UPS buildings and so forth. And once the infrastructure is, is in place, then of course all the telescopes will come in and will be erected in, in Chile, uh, connected. We will have a data center there with uh, high power computing on site. And so basically a, a full fledged observatory. The timeline for that is five years of construction phase from 2023, uh, when, when the full funding will become available and then followed by uh, currently projected 30 years of operations phase. Uh, that's quite normal for observatories that uh, the operations phase is much longer and in terms of funding also uh, it's, it's more costly than, than the construction you, you pay every year the, uh, the operations cost. Now one glimpse on the long term development, although that is a bit far away because we haven't built the observatory yet, but it will come of course, uh, no technology uh, will survive for 30 years and we all know that uh, when you look back 30 years what was state of the art then uh, is, is not state of the art today. And so there are some options here uh, for the 30 years operational lifetime. We can see that uh, with additional funding, we would build more telescopes and cameras. And the simple equation is more telescopes, better science capabilities, like very often. Uh, same is true for SKA. And so everybody strives for having the maximum number of telescopes uh, that, that are affordable. The cameras, we foresee uh, quite some development. Uh, right now, the silicon detectors uh, are limited for smaller cameras, but uh, there are developments underway to also use that for large cameras with corresponding advantages. More pixels, so not only 2,000, but five or 10,000, and that will then translate into more complex cameras, higher sensitivity. And last but not least, improve the detection mechanism for the scientifically um, interesting events, uh, which we call machine learning. So that's uh, basically fully automatic filtering out those events that are interesting for the scientists. And for the software, as we know, software is never finished. Uh, it's, it's an ever ongoing uh, effort and, and will improve, of course. And one topic here that we can see is also machine learning, apart from control systems and basically what uh, what will have to be done over 30 year operational lifetime. But we see a lot of potential here that uh, with automatic machine learning, uh, we can get better science uh, with this observatory. And that's all. And that's a real picture of the telescope on, on La Palma at sunset, uh, quite beautiful, as I find. And, and that's all what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang, for your presentation. Uh, it's interesting to see that you mentioned machine learning. I think you were not the only speaker. So it seems that it's a trend in astronomy to use these artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies to process all these enormous amounts of data that, that are generated. I also have to say that I actually visited La Palma some years ago when the LST-1 was under construction and I climbed the, platform, the stairs to the immediate platform and I was really impressed by the scope <laughs> 
and the size of this LST. So it's, it will be quite impressive when the four of them will be built. Yeah, it's, so big. it's big indeed. Thank you for the presentation. Yeah, thank you. And now uh, we finished with the with this with the presentation session. Some of you have asked about the recordings. We're going to upload the recordings on our BSBF YouTube website. You can access this on our BSBF website. There is the link to the YouTube page, and we will also um, upload the presentations in the BSBF website as well. So they will be available in a few days, probably. And now. Uh, now we start the, the question and answer session. So uh, I would like to introduce Michel, Michel Hubner, who is the Swiss ILO. And he, I give the floor to him to, to start these questions. So if any of, you, any of you wants to raise any topic, just go ahead and send the question and we can, we can address it to any of the speakers. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, welcome to this uh, Q&A session. Uh, and thank you very much, of course, to, to our five uh, speakers this morning. I think the, the, the content was extremely rich and dense. Uh, the challenge now is, uh, is obviously to, um, how, to, uh, how to process this large amount of, of information. I hope this Q&A will a little, a little help to, to navigate into these very interesting uh, activities. Uh, so, um, yeah, we will, of course, uh, the, the, the audience this morning is, is industry, so we, I, I will try to orient the discussion into yeah, the, the interests of the industry, of course, and, and the ways to, um, uh, to get access to, to these activities, to participate. Um, we have already a, a few uh, questions on the, on the q and I will pick them up immediately, but please um, don't hesitate to, to add more questions. I will, I will pick them up as, as, uh, as they come in. So I think there's a, yeah, there was a first question to um, Günther Hasinger about, um, you know, the, um, you, you presented some, some key, te key, key, key technologies you, you are looking after, cryogenics, uh, X-ray, uh, cold atom interferometry, uh, and, and also the, the, the new, new power sources. So, so there was one question, which is uh, about nuclear propulsion. Uh, is this a relevant uh, future topic for, for ESA? Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, Michel. Uh, I have, I think, already typed in some preliminary answer. So yes, indeed, uh, isotopic uh, heat and power sources are very important for solar system exploration. Mm -hmm. And both for, for instance, lunar stations um, that are becoming important for the future, because you know, in, on the moon, you always have 14 days of night and 14 days of sunshine. And so you have to bridge that, but also for um, distant uh, outer solar system exploration. So far, only the NASA, um, Russia and China has um, uh, isotopic power, but there are actually sincere discussions going on in uh, ESA and there's technology development to de develop this um, capability on our own. I think it will be largely political, um, for instance, whether um, uh, France will allow nuclear power to be launched from Kourou. Um, so if you have that power, you also have to have the rocket um, capabilities to do it. Uh, in parallel, we are also developing um, or looking at a fuel cell technology, which could also be interesting for outer solar system and would not be isotopic. But this is clearly a very important element. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. I mean, in the same range of questions, do do you see uh, do you see niche technologies which which uh, are missing, which would be provided? Uh, uh, also to, to reduce uh, somewhere, I'm thinking mostly about electronics, to re reduce our dependency uh, uh, towards other countries like the US or Asia. I, I think this is a, a topic which is also very interesting for ESO and everybody else. I mean, the, the fact that we are so dependent on infrared sensors, for instance, uh, on the US, I, I think there, there is a push going on Europe-wide to become independent in, in some of those key technologies and, and detectors is clearly something. So for instance, ESA is considering a potential as follow-up of Gaia um, in the near-infrared where we would re require huge um, focal planes uh, with near-infrared detectors. Um, and uh, this is becoming a 
pos possible technology development uh, for us. But I think Norbert probably uh, could uh, chime in there for ease from, from the ESO side. Yeah, so I, I, I agree. I think I mentioned this in my presentation. So uh, uh, there, there are two technologies of detectors which uh, we should collectively uh, push forward. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, CMOS technologies for, for, for visible applications uh, to, um, to, to not to replace, but to, to reinforce the availability of uh, visible detectors beyond the uh, CCD technology, which now is uh, managed by only one or 1.5 supplier. And, and infrared detectors, um, as said here, um, right now we rely essentially on, uh, on technology from the US, so Teledyne, uh, to not name it. Um, so this is our baseline at this point, 4K, 4K detectors for, for, for our first generation of instrument. But we would like also to push alternative technology like the one I mentioned before, so EAPDs uh, from Leonardo in UK. There is also some effort in France uh, from the old lab, uh, L'Etilir, um, which I think ISA is also uh, pushing forward. Uh, so, so these are two avenues for infrared detectors, but we still some way to go because in both cases, we are, they are still at the level of 1K by 1K detectors. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Norbert. Um, there's a, there's a, another question to both of you. It says, "What are?" Sorry, Michel, if I, if I can add something, yeah, yeah, yeah. Issue. Go ahead. And on the side of EST, we also have the, this need of new new detectors because for for, for the sun, as I mentioned, we need large format high speed detectors, six K by six K detectors. In some cases, these the uh, these detectors do not exist. Uh, uh, by far, especially in the infrared, uh, EST will operate up to 2.2 microns, and in the region above one micron, there is the, the need for, for, for these detectors. Especially in this range, we rely on Teledyne, but if at Europe, uh, at, uh, there is a, if there's a European effort in this direction, we will certainly support it and, uh, support it and uh, be uh, in favor of that. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. There's now another set of questions concerning uh, high high uh, high power computing. What are the yeah what are, what is the demand? What are the challenges you see uh, in in this direction? Uh, compute computing technologies. Uh, maybe I can start from the ESA point of view, and this is actually broader than the science program alone. Um, we are, we are discussing currently also for Earth observation. Um, uh, to create so-called digital twins. Uh, these are very super powerful models um, where you have to have high power computing, maybe even quantum computing uh, to uh, create these uh, very fast response uh, models for Earth observation. And we are talking uh, to the European Commission uh, who is setting up um, these high performance computer centers all around Europe and, and ESA wants to participate uh, in that. Um, I believe there's very strong push from the SKA side. So this is probably something uh, that uh, you should um, reply to. Absolutely. Uh, currently, the SKA-1 design is throttled by the availability of computing power. We could easily use the number one supercomputer in the world, uh, even in, in the future time frame, uh, because of the enormous data throughput involved so we're limited by the classes of observations we can make and whether or not we can compute in real time for those observations currently and so even the most powerful computer in the world would probably only just about be able to allow us to do all of our science cases in real time so we're going to push constantly okay thank you there's there's a, again a question on, on this um, on, on this uh, transverse technologies, so to say. Um, to what extent different type of research infrastructure such as telescopes, synchrotrons, and fields are joining forces in detector development or definition of specific of specification for industrial component suppliers, for instance, CCD or CMOS devices? Who wants to respond? Uh, maybe I could start. Um... 
we have an organization which is called Aeroforum, where uh, ESA, ESO, CERN, uh, EMBL, so all the big uh, intergovernmental European organizations are part. And we are also talking to uh, some of the um, other organizations where, where we indeed have working groups. Um, in particular, there's one technology working group. They are regularly making schools um, uh, where every year they invite uh, researchers from all the organizations uh, in order to coordinate um, uh, the technology developments. And, and I believe, I mean, maybe Norba, uh, uh, Norba Uba, sorry, <laughs> um, can chime in, but I, I believe this would be a very good forum also to include some of the uh, non-intergovernmental organizations. Yeah, well, I think I, I, I fully agree. So, so uh, we have already ongoing uh, discussion on these detector development, uh, as I said, with ESA. So Curve Detector is a good example uh, where we uh, took some time to converge on some requirements and, and before we place a contract. Uh, in terms of needs for, for uh, infrared detector, whether they are fast for AO, uh, or, or, or for scientific application, scientific application, I mean focal plane scientific applications, uh, I, I'm sure that we can really converge on some common requirements. The same for CMOS device versus CCD. Uh, we got already some, some discussion in that direction. So. I'm thinking about the, the ATTRACT uh, European project. Are you both involved into this program? So ISO is involved in ATTRACT, uh, coordinating uh, uh, some of the work together with the CERN. Uh, so that we, we are involved there, yeah. I don't know, I, don't, I believe we are not involved from the ISO, ISA side. So this is an interesting element. Yeah. Okay, I, um, I continue maybe with, um, uh, specific uh, specific question to to you Norbert um, uh, the question is um, with with the uncertain this is more a political question by the way um, but with the uncertainty of the the other telescopes um, the other um, extremely large telescopes the um, GMT and MMT um, is there do you see an opportunity that um, uh, there is a cooperation platform um, uh, to yeah to to be uh, to be built uh, with with the Americans or with other partners outside Europe to and and to to, to in order to to feed um, uh, and to upgrade the, the the ELT the European Telescope. Okay, uh, so I would say uh, a formal platform is always a bit complicated. Um, now, I, I can give some concrete examples. So, uh, in, in the recent past, uh, uh, ISO didn't have any problem to have some collaboration, for instance, for Keck, with Keck uh, Observatory in the US. And actually, we co founded uh, the development of the laser gas star that I showed before in my presentation. So, at the VLT, for, for, for the industrial development, this was a co founding between ISO and Keck and also uh, actually the Re European Commission. So it was more or less a one third, one third, one third share for the development cost of these lasers. Uh, so this was relatively successful. Uh, more recently, we had a collaboration on different neural development with TMT uh, for uh, Kezo stack uh, deformable mirror, uh, which was a co-sharing cost um, for this development, I think it was with Silas in France, um, which actually ended, ended up uh, to a manufacturing contract for the T TMT Nefarious uh, instrument, the Fable Mirror. Um, so, on, on the case to case basis, uh, we can set up collaboration. Having a full platform is a bit complicated. I, I didn't mention, of course, uh, uh, GMT, but in a way, there was some kind of not formal collaboration, but you know, transfer of knowledge. If you think that the adaptive secondary at the VLT actually came from LBT, but it's the same kind of technology which would be used for GMT and the same kind of technology which is used for ELT. So 
So the, the, there are some, some you know, transfer of knowledge uh, uh, with institute funding the first stage and then other uh, funding agency funding the other stage and so forth. And, and we are very open, actually, we have been approached by uh, uh, the, the equivalent of the planet finder of TMT for the funding of the 128 by 128 iterator de Romol Miran. So there, there is room for, for, for collaboration on the case to case basis, yes. Uh, maybe I can put in uh, some political considerations. I mean, not as uh, uh, director of science of ESA, but as a former director in Hawaii uh, and very closely connected to the fate of the PMT. Um, I, I believe you are all hanging on our fingernails to get the decadal survey uh, out um, because the decadal survey has one strong element for funding both GMT and TMT. And if that uh, is decided positively, then I believe that there is still some chance to get uh, both of these telescopes working. Uh, but as you say, it is uncertain. OK, thank you. Let's see how it goes. Uh, next question now to, to Tim Stevenson concerning SKA. How much proportional SK1 will be compared to the overall SK program, as I understand the question? Yes, well, that calls for a simple numeric answer, but I'm going to give a much longer answer. So in 2010, uh, the vision was that we would build the true square kilometer, which is a much larger project than today's project. So in 2010, there was a, um, a conceptual design review in which the panel recommended that it was not a good idea to embark upon the full-size project and recommended that we scale it down by a factor of 10. So early in 2011, it was scaled down by a factor of 10. That is now 10%. But since then, there have been rebaselining exercises. So today, what is intended in the baseline design, which is what we have had approval to build, that is approximately, and of course, it's a complicated thing, not least because there are two telescopes and they've been scaled in slightly different ways, down to about 7% of the original vision. But that's the baseline design. And at the moment, the funding is, is, is not available for the baseline. And we're still in the process of collecting the funding to build the baseline, uh, but have started upon construction because, of course, interferometers are scalable. So we've started upon a construction exercise uh, aiming ultimately to build the baseline, which is, as I say, approximately 7% of the original vision. Okay, thank you, Tim. Maybe, maybe on my side, I mean, we, we see that uh, the, the, the contributions uh, to, to SK are extremely wide. I mean, there is a contribution from uh, many uh, non-European countries as well. Where, where do you see the, 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 the center of gravity or the, 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 the most uh, main key technologies coming from Europe and how, how could newcomers uh, still uh, you know, st step in? You, you, you mentioned that there was some shared fundings between the member states and, uh, and the, the office, the SK office. Can you eventually develop, extend a bit uh, yeah, the, our understanding, your understanding on, on how this uh, process may, may go on, the, the procurement process at SK with this mixed, uh, mixed procurement? Uh, yes, I mean, in terms of the, of, the, of the overall observatory development program, we expect uh, that the developing capabilities of, of the countries outside Europe, in particular, South Africa will have a greater and greater influence on the, on the technology development of, of the telescopes. We are a truly multilateral organization. We are not Eurocentric. There would be an issue if we dealt with things in a Eurocentric fashion. So we are a truly global organization. And what is happening because of the, of the original concept of the SKA is that there are countries, and I think again, notably South Africa, who have embarked upon a national uh, program in support of their development within radio astronomy. And now we have a highly successful radio telescope operating in South Africa, namely Meerkat, which is now making uh, uh, groundbreaking contributions to radio astronomy. So the, radio astronomy is a young, young instrumental science, and it is highly dynamic. And, and we're now going through an era where the 
the old guard within astronomy is now being supplanted or, or at least uh, uh, enhanced by uh, communities in other countries which are now taking the opportunity to develop. And I think the, 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 the big data challenge that, um, that uh, SK presents, and I'm grateful to, to my colleague Tyler for posting the actual numbers uh, you will see in the Q&A about the numbers we're having to deal with, that is a stimulus to many countries around the world who believe that their future, technological future, lies into big data to invest. So we will, we, we will all be surprised in 10 years' time where some of these innovations will come from. All right. What, what would be your recommendations for, for a newcomer company who, who, who feels there is a matchmaking with the, the technologies you, you presented during your talk? Would it be, I mean, to, to, to speak with... Uh, with the ILOs, with, with the scientific uh, institutes participating, with the project managers of, of the, 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 the ongoing uh, uh, project like Hyrax or the other one you mentioned from in Australia. What, what is, the, what is the, the approach you would take? The easiest thing for industry who are not already involved in, in radio astronomy technology development is the ILOs. The ILOs are absolutely critical to the way that we function. And as I said, the, the beginnings of the introduction of these technologies into radio astronomy will be on the basis of national programs. So the ILOs are, are aware of not only what is likely to be funded in terms of early stage research in any given country, but also the industrial base that will address that. So the ILOs are absolutely critical. And as I say, the, for the early stages, the SKA Observatory is not necessarily invested. The SK Observatory will invest once there is a reasonable level of demonstration of feasibility of the application of these technologies and their applicability to, to the science roadmap. Uh, that, that's when the observatory will become involved and will start co-funding uh, the studies that are necessary to, to mature those technologies towards the SK. Okay, thank you. Good to hear that, Tim. Another question to you is uh, on uh, each telescope, each SK telescope will record an order of five terabits per second on site and send these over 800 kilometers to Perth and Cape Town. Oh, that's okay. Um, yes, that's my colleague Tyler. Thank you. Uh, Tyler. Okay, okay. He, he's, um, yeah. These are he's, big numbers. Yeah, you. these are big numbers. So, so is it is it correct to say that SKA is 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 um, mostly a, um, a high data um, processing um, challenge more than you know a, an antenna radio uh, uh, or front end radio uh, challenge? Well, how do you see the let's say the the balance between um, yeah between the, the pure ra radio technology and and um, down, downstream the the complexity yeah of of, uh, of collecting the data and and uh, and the, yeah, the, the the processing speed of this huge amount of data I could talk about this for hours but I think everyone is familiar with the problem that if you have an imper imperfect data collection system it has long been the fashion that you compensate for the imperfections of your data collection system in software that is a kind of thing that's happened in the last 50 years or 60 years here, it's likely that if you build an imperfect data collection system or, or someone that, that could be improved, something that could be improved upon, you make the data processing challenge impossible. So it's very important that we build a state-of-the-art data collection system so that we reduce the burden on, on the computing that happens uh, at the back end. And so that means we have to make advancements. We can't simply build the cheapest dishes because the cheapest dishes will have unpredictable responses, uh, will behave, uh, well, basically unpredictably, will require a lot of calibration. So we need very high quality dishes and we need to do that because we have a large number of them, we have to do them at a low cost. So there's innovation going on in the design of even the, 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 the mechanical structures of the dishes, uh, but it has to be affordable innovation. So there's a balance going on. We're putting a lot of effort into getting that balance in the data collection side right. 
whilst studying constantly the, the computational burden that is represented by our imperfect signal chain. So it's an interesting problem and it's not a simple, I can't answer your question very simply, uh, but there's a, there's a major amount of intellectual effort happening at both ends of that equation. Okay, <laughs> I understand you can speak for hours <laughs> on that topic. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, there's two questions remaining. Um, one for Manuel Colados concerning EST now. Uh, there, um, a company from Germany asks if it's possible to, to participate even while being a non-member non, non to, to, yeah, to, to this project. How do you see the, the overall participation? Maybe more generally, how do you procure? I mean, do you, do you go to the, the, the usual VT, VTO um, uh, procedures, rules, or, or what, is, what is the, let's say, uh, the, the main procurement uh, rules you, you apply? Well, first I have to say that Germany is a partner of the project. The only thing is that the funding has not been consolidated yet, but the research institutes are working towards the contribution as a uh, first as a centralized by the ministry, and then there are in-kind contributions in terms of, of instruments. So in that sense, the bids that will be centralized by the project office <clears throat> will be announced openly. Uh, and, uh, and any company in the world can apply for, um, to, uh, for the bid. So there is no restriction at all for to which company can apply. Another thing is how the uh, uh, countries uh, manage their in-kind contributions, especially for the instruments. So this is where they, we expect their, their, their income. And uh, they might restrict it to the national companies, or I don't know. This is up to each uh, each uh, country or each uh, partner or institution how to handle these uh, national uh, uh, contributions. But in terms of the of the general uh, course for tender, they are open to any company in the world. Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Manuel. I think um, time is uh, running out for QA. Michel, can I, can I, yeah, can can I yeah, make yeah, a sure. question? It's regarding what Manuel said. Uh, several of you mentioned uh, like long-term plans related to future instruments like Manuel, like Norbert, like Günther also. And to us, to the, to the industries and even the ILOs, procurement for the telescopes is clear. The organizations run them. But procurements for the instruments for industry see, seem sometimes a bit trickier because it's the institutes who have to answer the calls and then maybe even produce the instruments with in-kind contributions. And sometimes industry and even SMEs have good capabilities but don't really know how to access these consortia. So do you want to give any comment on this, any of you? Yeah, I can. Yeah, this is, this is uh, certainly uh, a topic which yeah, at least in our case, I don't have a general uh, answer. Uh, in the case of EST, the instruments will be managed in principle by the institutes, and the way they do it uh, depends on them. It might be that they I, I, I apply uh, internal resources for the development of the, of the instrument, or it may be that they open uh, bids for, for the industry. And this is something that uh, will be, uh, it might be different uh, for, each, uh, for each partner, yeah. <clears throat> Maybe in the case of ESA, I can say that we are in the currently in a kind of transformation where we are looking for a new paradigm, how the instruments are provided. Um, classically, it was so that the ESA was building the spacecraft and was taking care of the launch. And then the member states with their scientific institutes provided the instruments. Uh, and this is working relatively well for solar system missions where you have one project with 10 instruments, smaller ones, which the consortia can do. But for the big astronomy missions, like for instance, Plato or um, Athena, Lisa, Ariel, it turns out that these instrument consortia are becoming so big that no, none of the scientific institutes really has the resources to manage those in, in uh, organizations. And so 
ESA is stepping in more and more to manage the instrument consortia. Um, so to help with the uh, program managers, the project managers. But therefore, we also want to come in very early in the system design and in the setting up of the consortia. So there will be much more a partnership than a kind of a delivery agency um, relation. Uh, and we are we need uh, the help of industry on one hand, but also of the scientific institutes to make that work. Yes, thank you. Maybe a last question to Wolfgang Bild. Do you have a similar transverse technology roadmap as was presented by ESO, for instance, or as we said, do we have to, to go to the different institutes participating to, to CTA? Is there, yeah, is there a generic uh, procurement uh, um, office for, for CTA? What is, yeah. what is the concept at SCTA? Yeah, okay. Thank you for that question. I should have said in my talk that a large part of CTA will be delivered as in-kind contribution. So very similar to what Manuel said. Mm -hmm and also SK has a similar scheme. So it's managed by the individual instrument consortia. And so up to three quarters of what we actually put uh, down in, in the desert and on La Palma will come as in-kind contribution and it's managed by them. So for, for example, for a telescope type, there's a leading institution and they will issue the call for tenders and so forth. Uh, some of the part that is under our responsibility is certainly the infrastructure in the South and, and that we manage either through ESO uh, so ESO is our hosting organization and the tenders will be done for Cheetah through ESO. So anybody who works with ESO will see that on, on the ESO uh, uh, information web pages. But specifically for cameras and telescopes, it's really the individual in-kind providers that uh, manage this, issue the calls for tender within their own frameworks. So we do not have a, say, a central procurement agency that takes care of all, but it's it's very distributed. Okay. Thank you, Wolfgang. I, I, I don't see any more questions on the file, so maybe it's time to, to close this session. I would like to thank you all again for, for your participation, and I hope this uh, session was useful to you and provided some, yeah, some clarification. Um, so thank you. I give back the floor to, to Xavier to, to conclude the webinar. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Michel, for, for agreeing to moderate this session and to all the speakers. So we finished right on time. I'm very pleased. I'm going to share my screen again for some final information. So here it is. Uh, after this webinar, I mentioned at the beginning that this is the first episode of a mini series of three webinars in which we present the future of European research infrastructures in three areas. So we had this one on astronomy, and then, excuse me, and then we have the next coming up, the next webinar on 11 November uh, from 9.30 to 12, the same time as today. And this webinar is going to be devoted to fusion technologies. There will be speakers from Fusion for Energy, from ITER, and so on. And I think it will be very interesting for the industry that is here and other types of industry as well. And then the last episode of the series is on 30 November, and it will deal with high energy accelerators and synchrotrons, the same. We, we will try to provi provide the long-term vision, strategies, roadmaps, and development programs and uh, most of the most important European synchrotrons and, and high energy accelerators like CERN, ESRF, EXPEL, and so on will be there with us. So with this, I would like to thank all speakers, all the participants who have connected. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I think it has been quite successful. And I leave you with this nice uh, picture of Granada. And we all hope to really see you in, in one year's time exactly to be there physically, finally to be able to, to engage in networking and learn about what uh, the RIs have to offer to industry and industry to RIs as well. So thank you all and see you in Granada.